Sandy was certainly right about chopping up the numbers lesson. They really did a number on that one. Uh, they maintained the story. But there's some other conversation in that story that's worth reading. And you might be interested to know what happens to uh, poor El Dad and me dad. So we gotta read on <laughs> when you get home. Pull up numbers and, and chapter 11 and go to the scene. <coughs> How many of you, though, before we get into that, how many of you, when you heard the reading from James, thought back to our uh, Lenten focus on healing from this year? That was the theme verse or theme passage uh, to go and be anointed and healed, to confess and so on. That was the, the fitting theme for Lent this last year. Now, today we're going to focus on the reading from Mark, specifically on that interesting phrase, salted with fire. It's a great great image, and one that it just sounds like those things should not go together. Salt and fire. But salted with fire, we're going to examine that, what that means. Uh, because salt in itself is such a great biblical image, likewise fire is, and here we have those two things combined. You know, it's like the old TV commercial, it's not that old, about the peanut butter and the chocolate. Your chocolate got on my peanut butter, and your peanut butter got on my chocolate. If any of you are chocoholics, you understand that adding peanut butter to it can only somehow enhance it. I, I feel sorry for folks who have a peanut allergy because they're missing out on one of the world's greatest chocolate treats. I have a friend in Florida uh, who looks forward to the holiday seasons because the Reese's company comes out not with their little Reese cups, but with the special ones like the uh, Reese's pumpkin. The reason why he likes that a bit is because they've inevitably, by making it larger, changed the ratio of chocolate to peanut butter. He likes more peanut butter than, than chocolate, and that's what you get with those special ones. Anyway, enough about that. It's the idea of taking two things that have now become commonplace together in our world, chocolate and peanut butter, bringing them together, and you get something else. Here, you're salted with fire. Shouldn't you be salted with salt? And burned with fire, or salted, you know, seasoned with salt, we might say, and cooked with fire. What's the, how are we combining salt and fire? We're going to examine what it means literally, some salt images, some fire images, but also figuratively what Jesus is getting at with this lesson. And that'll take us back into the, the meat of the gospel reading there for today. So first, let's look at salt. Salt is one of those uh, elements that shows up. It's a mineral. You can find it in the ocean, find it in the ground. Uh, it's just there. Sodium chloride, NaCl. And it does something to our taste receptors. Uh, how many of you grew up thinking there was salty and sweet? Those are the two taste buds on your tongue, right? You either have salty or sweet. And now they're beginning to say that there are more than just salty and sweet. There's something called umami. Anyone heard of that? It's this Japanese idea of sort of a savory sensation um, or other sort of tastes like sour. This one, oh yeah, well, we okay, talk about sour, okay. Um, bitter is another one. We get bitterness. More than just salty or sweet, but salt is one of those that our tongue definitely, you know, without question, responds to. How many of you have gone swimming in a public pool and got a little of that chlorine water in your mouth? Ugh. Now they've started putting salt water in public places. We're finding out that salt does a pretty good job too, just on its own. And it's a much less... I don't know, that's relative. To me, at least, to be in a saltwater pool and get a little of that in your mouth by mistake is a whole lot more, um, better, much better than getting that chlorine taste in your mouth. Salt works. You heard the phrase salt in the wound? Oh, the idea that that actually causes more pain, but at the same time has an effect on the wound? Salt draws out moisture. Salt is uh, crystalline. It's abrasive. 
My wife used to work at Sizzler a long time ago. She was a waitress and a hostess at Sizzler. And their trick was, you know, there were always um, salt packets available, and there were always lemons, and they had to clean the coffee pots. And so they would pour in a couple of salt packets, squeeze in some lemon juice, put it under the ice maker, and then give it a shake. And the acerbic acid and the uh, lemon juice and the rough action of the salt before it had a chance to dissolve, and in with the ice, of course, uh, which kept it really cold, scrubbed the pot cleaned out the coffee pot. Salt can be abrasive. We put it on the ground. Although now the sort of salt we put on the ground is, uh, well, not really salt. It's still chemically a salt. It's not the kind of table salt that you put on your table. So that in the winter, when the ground is slippery, we don't slip. We have salt as an abrasive, right? Salt has so many uses. You get the idea. How many can you think of places in your life where you find salt? And what about fire? Fire is the same way. I'm trying to find a good fire joke this week, but I couldn't come up with one. So if anybody has a good fire joke for me, uh, I was thinking about the invention of fire and how it came to be. And we've discovered, someone along the way discovered how to use fire. Fire is perhaps one of the most ancient methods of cooking. Cooking a food right on the fire. Anyone ever cooked a steak directly on the hot coals before? I don't mean on a grate above them. I mean, here's hot coals, and you just lay the meat right on it. It just sears it. And if the coals are hot enough, you don't get a lot of carbon transferred into that meat. It works. I've never tried it, but it works. (laughs) Alton Brown tells me it works. That's how I know. And yes, you can actually cook it right on the coals. We, We cook with fire. We use fire to do any number of amazing things. Most of our world is powered by combustion in some sort. Burning of one thing to produce another. Burning metal to change its characteristics. Cooking our food. Just two prime examples, without which we would live in a vastly different world. And then you can combine the two. Science and technology has given us the opportunity. Not fire in the literal burning sense of things, but fire is in the heat that comes from solar irradiance. Perhaps you've seen those vast bowls of mirrors in the desert. Pictures of these from above. Looks like a a big bowl of reflective covering, although it's flat. They're laid out, all of these mirrors, in a circle, concentric circles, around a tall tower, and at the top of the tower, White hot is where the focus beam of that light is gathered onto a chamber. Can you guess what's inside that chamber? Salt. Salt. First time I heard that, I was taken aback. What do you mean salt? Not just salt, but molten salt. Salt salt that gets so hot, it melts. You ever heard of such a thing? Isn't that amazing? Molten salt? Now, what can you do with molten salt? Oh, a lot. Because once you've taken the time to heat it up, it stays hot for a very long time. In fact, if you can warm up salt, it'll stay hot long overnight and into the next day, and then some. It's one of those problems with solar thermal heat. Well, what happens when the sun's not, si- it's not shining? Well, if it's been shining long enough to heat up that molten salt, you can still make steam and turn a turbine. That's the way those solar cookers make electricity. Salt and heat, salt and fire combined to produce the magical sparks that live in our walls and travel through the wires, right? Yeah, but those are the earthly images of salt and fire. What about the biblical images of salt and fire? Well, here's one of them right here, and it's more than enough for us to focus on because Jesus begins to get into it a little. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, Jesus says. Don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? First time I studied this passage, I had to look it up. Can salt really lose its saltiness? You can dissolve it. You can 
put it in water and dissolve it. And if you add enough water, you can really dilute it down to the point that it doesn't taste like much. In fact, we need some salts. That's what those researchers at the University of Florida discovered when they invented Gatorade. We need the electrolytes from salts. And in the right proportion, drinking that kind of salt water can actually help us. Essentially what it is, flavored salt water that you're drinking. Um, but not salt water in the ocean sense. But can it lose its saltiness? Can you season it then at that point, if it could? We're getting into uh, molecular, molecular chemistry. We're getting into material science here. Have salt in yourselves, he says. What does that mean? Do we need salt? To, do we, yeah, we have to consume it, yes. How many of you have ever tasted a salt lick? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Those big pink rocks out there. No, I haven't offended them. It's the choir. Don't worry. <laughs> well, I may have, but it's the choir. <laughs> How much salt do we put in ourselves? How much does a body need? Perhaps someone with more medical knowledge than he can, can enlighten us to that. But is that what Jesus means? And what about fire? We see fire in scripture. Oh, yes. Pentecost comes to mind right away. The tongues of divided fire on their heads at Pentecost. Fire shows up throughout scripture. Was there fire in the Garden of Eden? I don't see any there. But it wasn't long after that that they began to kill and cook meat after they left. We saw fire make an appearance in the Old Testament for sure. But here, fire used in a figurative sense. This brings us back up into the text, back in verse 42. We get the millstone around the neck and being thrown into the sea. But then right away, in 43, Jesus changes the imagery from the millstone and the sea. And what do you find in the sea? Salt. A little bit of salt, perhaps, if you want to connect it there. To fire in verse 43. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell. And he probably could have just put a period right there and that would have been fine. But instead, it says, to the unquenchable fire. Now we have two things that don't quite make sense about these um, ideas, salt and fire. One is that salt can lose its saltiness and that we can somehow season it or not season it. And the other is that fire is unquenchable. I can think of one similar illustration from the Old Testament in which a fire burns and does not consume. That is, Moses and the burning bush. The bush was not consumed, but the fire burned within it. Now it's a different idea that fire is unquenchable. Even at the tomb of the unknown soldier, eternal flame. That, fire, that flame must be refueled. It is not magical and burns simply on its own without anything to consume. This candle up here has to be changed. Even though it takes a while to burn down, it still consumes the wax there inside the candle and the wick within it. Here we're talking about an unquenchable fire that just keeps burning. Is it because there's such a ready and steady supply of sinners in this world that the, the boilers of hell can be stoked with us? Or why does the fire just burn and burn and burn? And again, if your foot causes you to stumble, again, cut it off, be thrown into hell there, we don't get a fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out again. And now we get the fire again in verse 48. Where their worm never dies, we're going to save worms for another day. Where their worm never dies, and the fire is never quenched. Constant burning. What a horrific image of hell. This is one of those places where we get the idea of hellfire, right? Here it is. Throughout scripture, we see fire both as beautiful and useful and as terrible and unquenchable. Same thing with salt. 
salt, well, it can be used to season food and be quite useful. Or if it's not useful, another place Jesus says, its only use is to be thrown across the path. It's a grit to walk on. What do we do with salt and fire and faith? Salt on its own, we understand. Fire on its own, we understand. Now, where does faith fit into that? Now we combine the two, and we find the faith connection. The original conversation that kicked off this whole uh, diatribe, I guess, of that Jesus launches into about fire, which he wraps up with salt, uh, was this question that the disciples posed to him. John, actually. Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. He wasn't part of the twelve, but still he was doing it. How come he was doing this? Did he just follow it along? Did he decide to try it on his own? Was he a a kid that didn't get invited into the the club, but still peered through the knothole and learned the secret handshake? I mean, is that what's implied here, is that this is someone who um, isn't an official disciple, but is still doing the work of a disciple? This is a copy. Didn't Jesus get his branding right and put a little trademark symbol after a disciple? Is that what John's asking? Or maybe is it just that someone is out there casting out demons in the name of Christ? And John felt like they were honing in on the disciples' territory. Do you remember the last few lessons have been questions about power and authority? Peter, you're going to be the rock on which I build the church. No, Lord, you can't get crucified. Peter, you're acting like Satan. Stop it. That this idea of who's going to sit at the right or the left, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus says, you want to be the greatest? And he pulls a little child. Be like this child. Be the servant of all. Lose your life for my sake, and you'll gain it. Jesus is turning ideas upside down, left and right, and now John, still thinking worldly thoughts, not divine thoughts, says, wow, he was doing something amazing, but we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. Oh, John. But Jesus said, don't stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name That's the key phrase. John says he was casting out demons in your name. Jesus says no one who does a deed of power in my name. Christ is still at the center of this power, no matter who does it. Will soon be able afterward to speak evil of me. Why is that a concern? That someone would speak evil of Jesus. Well, we're going to see Jesus before the council, before the scribes, before the elders being spoken evil against him. Whoever is not against us is for us. For I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink, because you bear the name of Christ, will by no means lose their reward. It's as if Jesus says, are you concerned with the rewards of what you're doing? Are you concerned with the pedigree of what you're doing? As long as you keep it connected to Christ... As long as, without question, folks know that what you are doing, you are doing for the sake of and in the name of our Savior Christ, the Lord Jesus, then you're okay. Whether it's casting out demons or giving a cup of water. It's faith in action connected. And so as if to make the point, he gives us the opposite put a stumbling block before any of these little ones who believe. It would be better for you if the millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. Are you doing service? Are you loving in the name of Christ? In fact, I think there's an organization called Love, Inc. I know there is. I'm just teasing. You know what the Inc. stands for? In the name of Christ. Isn't that neat? Love, Inc. Love in the name of Christ. Service in God's name. That is having salt. That is having fire. Salted with fire. You are full of this good seasoning 
that salt brings. You have the passion and the heat that fire brings, and they come to life. Now we, with our, they come to life in our service. We, with our glasses, our Jesus glasses, can look ahead as well as look back. Use our Jesus glasses to see the Old Testament. We look ahead into the New. We see the tongues at Pentecost. We know what is yet to come. The fire that will come from above. The fire that does not consume. The fire that brings power for service. We need to be salty Christians on fire for service. Not unsalty Christians who, well, want to say this is our little corner of the world and we're going to do it our way and this is our little thing. And well, those people over there, that's good that they, they're Christians too, but they don't really have it quite right. I hear it a lot amongst Christians. I heard it back especially, not to pick on Baptists, they're good Christians. I hope they would say the same of us Lutherans, right? But I heard it often at Stetson from some of my Baptist friends. When we would have conversations about faith and they would say, or I should, should say specifically, we would have disagreements about faith, and they would say, well, I'll pray for you. What they really meant was, we understand it the right way, and I'll ask God to teach you the right way because you don't understand it. How arrogant. How absolutely rude of you. I don't need your prayer if you're trying to just use it to, as a club to set me straight. Teacher, they're casting out demons, but they weren't doing it in your name, so we tried to stop them. And then we got into this argument, and they explained to us how they loved you so much, and they saw the great things you were doing, and they just felt empowered to go and, and serve. And we said, well, that's all fine and all, but you've got to be part of, our, part of our group. Jesus had to have called you. Did Jesus call you? Well, no, not exactly, but, well, then I'll pray for you. Could you have heard the arrogance in John's concern. We tried to stop him, but he wasn't following because he's not following us. John, you need salt. John, you've got fire. Stay connected to Christ. Keep it connected. Because if you do any of these things in the name of Christ, you won't lose your reward. If you do any of these things in the name of Christ, no one will be able to speak evil of me. The salt will begin to work. You'll taste like a Christian. How's that for a phrase? You'll be on fire like a Christian. And no one will be able to know otherwise. Because they know it's Christ who's at the center of our service. All this to say, to boil it down to a nutshell, don't worry so much about whether or not you've got it right. If you feel the passion to serve, if you see the need and see the hurt, and you can meet the need and heal the hurt, do so in the name of Christ, that the world may know the love of